like to thank you guys first for coming here to pay attention to me for a little while. Um, I'm actually a little bit nervous about speaking in front of this audience. Most of my audiences are either my students, who I get to threaten with sad grades, or um, <laughs> other colleagues of mine who I'm just generally scared of. Um, but you guys are, are a bunch of smart math and science people, and I have to tread a line here where I'm not telling you any lies and also entertaining you. So I'm, I'm, I'm nervous. Um, I thought, uh, I'm not actually going to talk to you about ancient extinct things today. Um, I uh, have been recently involved with this big project to bring extinct things back to life. We can't do it yet. Um, but we might be able to soon. And uh, I was talking to people, sorts of people about it at lunch. And if you want to hear about that, invite me back and I'll talk about it next time. <laughs> no dinosaurs. No, no dinosaurs. They're too old. DNA does not survive that long. Anyway, today I thought I would start by asking a relatively simple question. And that is, is my clicker working? No. <laughs> that is, <laughs> what is a species? So this, it seems like this should be, there should be an obvious answer to this. This is something that scientists, biologists, we should have this down by now, right? Um, but actually, we don't. It's something that actually, that is still a, a, a pretty serious matter for debate in science and biology and evolution. Um, originally, when we started thinking about what is a species, we thought we would classify things based on what they looked like. And this makes a lot of sense. Things that are more closely related should look like each other, right? But then there are things like this. These two parrots are the same species. One of them is the female and the other one is the male. If we were to look at these and just classify them based on what they look like, we would certainly think that they were different species, but they're not. The male is the more brightly colored individual. He spends most of his time beneath the foliage in the Solomon Islands looking for food and he's more camouflaged with those dark colors. The female is the lighter colored individual, she's on top of the foliage, and so it's better camouflage for her to be more brightly colored. They're the same species. Of course, genetic information would have solved this for us. We would know that things which, that they have very similar DNA sequences and therefore are likely to be the same species. But, where do we draw the line with DNA? We know that I have a very similar DNA sequence to my sister, that the two of us have a similar DNA sequence to our cousins, but our cousins would be different from us, more different from us than we are from each other. If we were to step outside that and find another person of European descent, they would have similar genomes to ours, but more distant than us. We could step even further outside of that and say, what about Neanderthals? There are a lot of sequence similarities between all of us and Neanderthals, but certainly there are differences. So where do we draw the line and call something a species or not the same species? To try to make sense of this, biologists have come up with what we call the biological species concept. Have you guys learned about this? Yes. 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 So what does it mean? <laughs> what is the biological species concept? Right, so it assumes that if two species, if two individuals can interbreed, and if their offspring are viable, they survive, and fertile, they can themselves have offspring, then they're considered to be the same species. So that's pretty clear. They can interbreed, then they're the same species. So what's this? This is a Zorse. A Zorse. By convention, the dad's name, dad goes first. So Zorse is a daddy zebra and a mommy horse. And this is a viable offspring. So does that mean that horses and zebra are the same species? And what about this? Yeah, just, that's, that's made up. <laughs> but wouldn't it be awesome? Yeah? So it is true that there are some species that can interbreed with each other, and we still call them species. One of the most common examples is this. We know about ligers and tigons, and convention has it again that the dad comes first. So a tigon has a, a daddy tiger and a mommy lion, and a liger has a daddy lion and a mommy tiger. And these offspring are probably kind of confused, right? I mean, tigers are very solitary and surly, lions are quite social, so the offspring that is a hybrid of one of these things is gonna be a little bit confused. But mostly they live in zoos, right? So is hybridization actually also happening in places where we haven't put them together outside of their range accidentally. Well, I work a lot in Lycipia, which is in northern Kenya, and there are two species of zebra that you see there. This is a grevy zebra. He's got thin stripes, 
and a brown nose and big ears and a long tail here. And this is a plain zebra. There are more short and squat individuals with fatter stripes, smaller ears, black faces. And we've started to see over the last couple years increasing numbers of this, the hybrid offspring of a mating between a grevy zebra and a plain zebra. And like the confused ligers and tigons, these guys are a bit confused. The juvenile males tend to live with the plain zebra in herds. Um, grevy zebra are more solitary. Grevy zebra are also a lot bigger. So these juveniles are bigger than their other same age juvenile counterparts. So boy, plain zebra, indifferent, that are in these little boy tribes, come around and start picking fights with them. But he's just a baby, doesn't know how to deal with that, and ends up getting his butt beat up all the time because he's a bit confused behaviorally and genetically. He looks different from everything else. So hybridization is actually happening in places where, um, in natural places, where the ranges of species are starting to overlap. So we ask the question, is this a recent phenomenon or is this something that's been going on for a long time and is in fact part of long-term evolutionary processes? And to talk about this further, I, would, I thought I should talk about the polar bear, uh, mostly because it's a thing we've been working on recently in the lab, but also because this is the icon for climate change. And I'm here to talk about the influence of climate change on genetic diversity and biodiversity, why not talk about the polar bear? The polar bear is most closely related to the brown bear. And when we look at these guys, we can see that morphologically they look very different from each other. Some other traits that we have between them tell us that they're quite different. Polar bears are a lot bigger than brown bears. They have white fur instead of brown fur. They're very adapted to swimming. They've got webbed feet. They've got different musculature. They've got a different dentition because they have their canines. They feed almost exclusively on weddell seals. And whereas brown bears are adapted to climbing and running and digging, they eat berries as well as meat. You should be scared of them if you're ever working in the Arctic. I know I am. Um, they're very, very different from each other. And thinking about all of these things and all their behavioral differences, um, we would come to the conclusion that they are different species. But we find that in zoos, they can interbreed and they produce fertile hybrid offspring. And recently in the Canadian Arctic, people have started seeing bears that look like they are hybrids between polar bears and brown bears. And recently, some hunters actually killed one. Some genetic testing was done on one of these things and it is in fact a hybrid brown bear polar bear. So then we stand with the question of, is this because climate change is forcing polar bears to spend more time in brown bear, excuse me, in brown bear habitat? And if that is going on, is this causing the polar bear genome, we're worried about polar bears, right? Is this causing the polar bear genome to become diluted with brown bear DNA? Should we be worried that hybridization is another way that polar bears are going to become extinct in the near future thanks to climate change. So is hybridization a threat to biodiversity? So if we think again about these guys, this is a tree, an evolutionary tree that shows how they're related to each other. Brown bears and polar bears only recently diverged from each other, probably within the last half a million to a million years. Their closest relative outside of these two is the black bear. And the American black bear is the bear that we used when we were analyzing these guys. Brown bears are very phenotypically diverse around the world. They go from very light colored to very dark colored, and it's kind of partitioned in a nice geographic way. We could look at them genetically as well, and first I thought I'd tell you about the DNA, kinds of DNA that we use to do this analysis. There are basically two types of DNA inside all of your bodies. There's the nuclear DNA, and this is the DNA that lives inside every one of your cells. You inherit half of it from your mom and half of it from your dad. So as we go backward in time, it becomes diluted and tells you all about the genetic history of every single one of your ancestors. The other type of DNA in your cells is mitochondrial DNA. Mitochondria are little organelles that live inside every cell. They're responsible for getting energy back and forth across the nuclear membrane. And it has its own genome. But mitochondria are only inherited from your mom and then from your mom's mom and from her mom. So this is only telling us a very small amount of the evolutionary history of your body, the mitochondrial DNA. But there's a lot more mitochondrial DNA than there is nuclear DNA in every living organism. And so for a long time, most molecular genetic studies were done using mitochondrial DNA. In humans, for example, we've shown using mitochondrial DNA that we originated in Africa, we emigrated out of Africa and dispersed into Europe, 
dispersed also into Asia, across Asia, into North America, and down into South America. And we know how fast mitochondria mutates, how quickly it evolves. So we can put some approximate ages about when these different dispersals happen. And this is all from looking at your mom's, 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 mom's history, the mitochondrial DNA. We can do the same thing with bears. And with bears, we see that their mitochondrial DNA says that they're pretty structurally divided, that across geography, the mitochondria fall into these conserved blocks. We call them clades. So here, this clade right here, clade four, I'm sorry, this clade right here, clade one, is only found in Europe for some reason. The number one has disappeared from my slide. Apologies there. Um, this one here is only found um, around, right around the northwestern part of the US right now. Clade three actually evolved in Africa, this blue clade here, and dispersed this way across Beringia, the opposite direction that humans disperse, into Siberia, all the way across into Asia. And this clade two right here is only found on these tiny little islands off the coast of Alaska called the ABC Islands. Now you might look at that and go, that's an awful lot of sequences for a bunch of bears that are just found on a tiny little suite of islands off the coast of Alaska. That's because it's a bit of an exaggeration. These bears are also found across the entire whole Arctic. But these are not brown bears, these are polar bears. So this clade is polar bears, and these are all brown bears. And this is weird, right? So this is suggesting that polar bears evolved very recently from brown bears, and probably from these brown bears that were isolated to these ABC islands. And that's weird, because those bears have only been there for about 20,000 years. And the huge number of differences between brown bears and polar bears would suggest that they have a much deeper evolutionary history, that they evolved from brown bears much longer ago than 20,000 years ago. So a question remains, is this pattern that we see with mitochondrial DNA recent? and due to some hybridization that's happened and transfer of this mitochondrial lineage, or is it old? Is this really the origin of polar bears? Fortunately, whoops, fortunately, we can test this by getting DNA from a very old polar bear fossil. This is a polar bear fossil that is about 100,000 years old. That's from Svalbard. This is work that was done uh, by some colleagues at different institutions. I wasn't involved in this particular work. And they managed to sequence DNA from the jaw of this very old polar bear and we built another tree. This is a more complicated tree, so I just drew some arrows here to show you where the polar bears are. These are all the living polar bears, and those are the very old polar bears. And this is weirder. So this means that polar bears have this, but these are brown bears, and these are all brown bears, and these are polar bears. So there must be some weird, complicated history there where there's a lot of interbreeding between brown bears and polar bears, and genetic material passing forth all over different things. And it also means that we can't do this with just mitochondria, because the mitochondrial DNA signal is a disaster. We cannot solve this question using this type of data. So a couple of months ago, some colleagues published a paper in Science where they had actually sequenced 14 genes from the nuclear genome from brown bears and polar bears. And the results of their study suggested that this is something that's very old, that this divergence between polar bears and brown bears happened about somewhere between 500,000 and a million years ago, and that the mitochondrial pattern is just an artifact, a fluke, weird stuff going on with bears hybridizing and mating with each other. But if you look at their 14 genes separately, it's actually not that clear. Here's one story where polar bears and blue are completely different from brown bears and brown, which are evolved from black bears and black. That's one of their genes, a little map that tells you about their relationship to each other. Here's one where it looks like polar bears evolved from black bears, and all brown bears also evolved from black bears. Here's one that's got polar bears and brown bears together, and some more with more mixtures between polar bears and brown bears. So I look at these results and I say, what? I don't get it. Like, weird? Really? So we went out and we decided we would try to fix this by, instead of looking at just 14 genes, sequencing the complete genomes of a whole bunch of polar bears and brown bears, and seeing if with complete genomes, three billion base pairs from each individual, if we could finally figure out what was going on with polar bears and brown bears. And this plot shows the results of the study. So these blue things are comparing all of our seven polar bear genomes against each other. What this means is that we would take one polar bear genome and the other polar, polar bear genome and compare each position along the genome and say, if they're different from each other, we'll count them. 
and we count the average number of differences between each polar bear per 10,000 bases. And we get that the average number of differences between all of our polar bears is somewhere here around two to five bases every 10,000 years. That means this is a very recently diverged population. So this is old black bear lineage, and this is through time. We did the same thing with the brown bears, and we said that the brown bears have this much diversity, that suggests that they diverged from each other longer ago than the polar bears. So there's more diversity in brown bears, they're an older population than polar bears. But the interesting thing happens here, and the difference between the red line and the yellow line is that we had two brown bears that we'd sequenced. One of them was from this weird ABC Island population, and the other one is from the mainland Alaskan population. And it looks here like there's a difference in how closely related to polar bears those two brown bears are. It looks like the ABC Island brown bears, these are the ones that have the polar bear mitochondria, are more closely related to polar bears than the mainland Alaskan population is. It's marginal, but it's there. There is a closer relationship between these two things. So is this a signal of past hybridization between these two species, suggesting that all the stuff we're seeing in Canada right now is not super new and super weird, but something that's been going on for a really long time. So the way that we test for past hybridization is we developed a statistical test called the D statistic. And I know you guys are all smart math and science folks, so I'm going to explain to you how this D statistic test works, and hopefully you'll be able to get it. Stop me if I'm confusing here, okay? It's also called the Abba Baba test, which is more fun to say, um, but slightly less correct, actually, the absolute value of this normalized by Abba, Baba. So, what we've done here is we have a genome from the ABC Island bear, a genome from the mainland Alaskan brown bear, a polar bear genome, and a black bear genome. And we use the black bear genome so that we know what the ancestral state of each site of the genome is. So we know what the first, what the original ACGT of the genetic code is. We know that because we have the black bear genome. And then we ask, how many times is there a mutation where some of these guys differ from the black bear, but that mutation is shared between the ABC Island bear and the polar bear, or between the mainland bear and the polar bear? So another, so I'm just gonna go through now the types of mutations that you get with this test so you can kind of see this. So here's your tree that shows that your, uh, your black bear is outside and your polar bear is here and your two Eight, two brown bears are over there. So this is just suggesting that you have different evolutionary histories for each of these three species. So most of the sites that we see in the genome, 1.5 billion of the sites that we saw in this genome, all four of these, all three of these species were identical to each other. This is normal. There's not that much diversity among these things. So a lot of the data was not informative. They were all the same. Sometimes we found that these three individuals were the same, and they differed from the black bear. That's because a mutation happened here, somewhere in between the lineage along the, that separates the black bear from these guys. So a mutation occurred around here. Sometimes we saw that the two brown bears were the same, and the polar bear and the black bear shared the same allele. This is because the mutation happened here, along the lineage that separated the polar bear from the brown bears. Sometimes we had mutations where the polar bear was different, the mutation happens along this lineage. The same is true for the two brown bears, so we had mutations that were distinguishing each of those lineages from each other. None of these are informative for the Abba Baba test. And sometimes we have this weird pattern, where either the mainland brown bear and the polar bear share the same allele, or the ABC Island brown bear and the polar bear share the same allele, and we ask, where is the mutation happening in this particular tree? How can we tell where that mutation has actually occurred? So this particular pattern will emerge in two ways. These are pretty tough concepts. So when in a population, once a mutation arrives, I sat in a sophomore class today, they were talking about genetic drift. We know that these mutations will drift around in that population for a long time before they go to fixation. Sometimes it takes a really long time. Sometimes it takes longer than the speciation process itself. 
so that there are alleles that are in our population as humans that are drifting around, not fixed one way or the other, but that are also drifting around in, say, the chimpanzee population. That's just because the mutation happens in the common ancestor to us and chimpanzees and is still drifting around, still drifting around, not fixed. That happens here. But that's not going to happen at the same rate along every branch. So a lot of these mutations that we see where this is shared with this and this is shared with this are going to be due to that. It's called incomplete lineage sorting. The brown bear lineage is not completely sorted. Drift is still going on. Or the polar bear lineage is not completely sorted. Drift is still going on. But that will happen the same amount in one lineage or the other. But if there's a difference, if there's an excess of mutations shared between this guy and this guy, or shared between this guy and this guy, then that is very strong evidence that hybridization has happened with gene flow between those individuals much later than the original speciation event. And that's why we do ABBA minus BABA and find the absolute difference of that. If there's a signal for more mutations shared like this or shared like this, that's evidence that there's been gene flow due to admixture, integration, since speciation. Everybody follow so far? Yeah? All right, good, going well. So in essence, a very simple way to put this is, if we know that the ABC brown bear has a T and the mainland brown bear has a G, what's the polar bear have? And we count the number of times the polar bear is the same as this guy, and we count the number of times the polar bear is the same as this guy, and we subtract those from each other, and then we find that there's evidence for hybridization in one way or another. And we found very strong signal. Well, okay, so here, what, what we've done here is we've done this test now asking whether we look at, if we compare any two polar bears, any two of our polar bears, is there a signal that there's brown bear DNA in one of those polar bears versus the other one? Is that ABBA minus BABA? If we're looking for brown bear DNA in polar bears, anywhere different from zero? And you'll see that it's not anywhere different from zero for this test. And then we also ask the same thing about the ABC Island bear. If we look at polar bears, is there a signal for DNA from the ABC Island bear in any of our polar bears compared to any other polar bear? And again, the answer is not statistically significantly different from zero, indicating no admixture. But if we ask instead whether there is ABC Island uh, bear in a polar bear versus mainland bear DNA in a polar bear, we find a strong skew for ABC Island bear DNA, sorry, for polar bear DNA inside the ABC Island brown bears. So we're finding a very strong signal that the ABC Island brown bears have polar bear DNA, whereas the mainland Alaskan brown bears don't have any polar bear DNA in them. This is a pretty big skew. This actually translates to somewhere between one and 4% of all of the ABC Island bear genomes, and there's four of them now, are made up of polar bear. But in the X chromosomes, you guys know what the X chromosomes are, right? <laughs> it's okay. You, don't, you only have one, so you be fine. <laughs> you said you didn't know what it was. Do you know what it is? <laughs> We've had a very strong signal that the X chromosome has a ton of polar bear DNA. A ton. 15% up to of the X chromosome is polar bear DNA on these guys. So this is something remarkable and very weird. So there is evidence for gene flow between ABC Island brown bears and polar bears since they actually diverge from each other, since their timing of speciation. So the next thing we wanted to know is, what way did, did it go? Was it ABC Island brown bears giving their DNA to polar bears, or was it polar bears giving their DNA to ABC Island brown bears? And remember, the scary thing here is, if brown bears are giving their DNA to polar bears, then the polar bear genome is becoming diluted and it is actually disappearing. The polar bear genome is being replaced by ABC Island brown bears. So that would be the bad result, the scary result. So what we did to test this, this question was we simulated a scenario in which we took a genome of a, oops, whoa, whoa. We took a genome of a brown bear here and we inserted bits of polar bear DNA into it and we asked if we then compare that brown bear with every other brown bear we have, does it look different? Does it look any different than other brown bears? 
And so here, the blue line is brown bears compared to brown bears, and the brown line is the same brown bears compared compared to the genome that has a little bit of polar bear in it. And they look pretty similar to me. They look pretty much the same. We did the same thing in the opposite direction. We took a polar bear genome, and we inserted bits of brown bear DNA into it, and we said, does it look any different? That's this blue line here. And yes, it looks very different. And this is easy to see because Polar bears today have almost no genetic diversity. Remember, they're very closely related to each other, a very recently derived population. Whereas brown bears have a ton of diversity. So as soon as we start sticking brown bear into polar bears, we see it, it's obvious. We can see that brown bear DNA sticking out of that undiverse polar bear genome, like a, like a sore thumb. So this is the direction. It's not the scary direction. It was good, right? It's the other direction the X chromosome. So we were very confused. We thought, okay, we, we knew what was going on. We had a hybridization between these things, but we couldn't think of any demographic scenario that would result in an X chromosome having so much more polar bear DNA than the Y chromosome. So we did a lot of demographic simulations, a lot of time writing computer programs in R and simulating the evolution of genomes and sleeping at our desks with our heads down and things like that and finally came up with a reasonably plausible scenario, which is actually pretty weird. What it looks like is that the whole story is due to boy brown bears being a little bit promiscuous. So in bears, uh, bears are uh, maternally phylopatric. That means that they all, the, the girls stay with their moms and the boys are the ones that go out looking for a new habitat. And uh, as boys were going out looking for a new habitat, they were actually venturing on to uh, the place where these polar bears lived, that was the ABC Islands, and encountering these polar bear populations. So what the scenario is, is that during the last ice age, the ice was a lot lower than it is today, and there were polar bears all the way as far south as the ABC Islands, and they were hanging out there. And the ice started to retreat by natural causes at the end of the last ice age. And polar bears somehow got stranded on these ABC islands where they were chilling out, little polar bear population. And then it kept getting warmer and nicer environment for brown bears. And these boy explorers went swimming across the channel that separated the islands from the Alaskan mainland. And they colonized the ABC islands where they ran into polar bears and mated with them. And in this way, the polar bear population started to get brown bear DNA in it and mostly boys. And over time, the same thing kept happening over and over again. And these polar bears that were isolated on the ABC islands eventually turned into brown bears. It was a population of polar bears that now looks like, acts like, and genetically for the most part, is a brown bear population. And the reason we see the difference between the X chromosome and the autosomes, that are not the sex chromosomes, are because when a boy comes over, he's only got one X and one Y, whereas the polar bears have two Xs. So two thirds of the time, the Xs are gonna come from polar bears. So their decay into brown bearism is gonna happen more slowly than with the rest of the DNA. It also explains the weird mitochondrial story. Mitochondria are only ever inherited from your mom. And if brown bears are only ever your dad, you're going to maintain that original polar bear mitochondrial genome. So, this is the solution to a very long-standing scientific question and scientific debate, and it's a lot simpler than we ever thought it was. The ABC Island brown bears are actually a population of polar bears. So natural hybridization like this may actually not be that uncommon. And it's not only not uncommon today, I mean, it is happening today, we've seen it in a couple examples now, but it probably happened quite a lot in the past as well. We have examples, for example, from polar bears, but also from bison. We know that the bison that live on the plains have cow DNA in them. Pretty much all of them have cow DNA in them now, and they all hybridize, produce fertile offspring. If you sequence a whole bunch of mitochondria from bison living in the plains in North America, about half of the mitochondria that you get is, is cow. It's just cows. We also have evidence that there was hybridization between armadillos during the late Pleistocene. There was an armadillo that lived in Florida called the beautiful armadillo that was the size of a Volkswagen bug. He has the same mitochondrial DNA as today's nine-banded little tiny armadillo. There was hybridization between that and the thing that lives here today at some point. And who knows what this is? 
Neanderthals and humans. So it turns out that every one of you in this room who is not purely of African ancestry is a hybrid between a Neanderthal and a human. It's true. Between one and four percent of all the genomes of people who live outside of Africa, whether it's of any sort of Asian or European descent, have an ancestor who was a Neanderthal. <laughs> it's kind of funny. And is climate change creating these potential hybrid zones that we're actually starting to see more hybrids? Probably. We probably are seeing that the ranges of different animals are starting to change. They're changing in response to climate. But this has happened in the past. And one of the things that annoys me the most about people who get up and start pontificating about how climate change is going to be the end of the world is the assumption that prior to climate change, the world was in stasis. This is not true. The world has always been changing. The rate of change right now is faster and different and challenging. But the world was not in stasis before we came along. We've only been around as a species for a pretty short time compared to everything else that's existed. So probably. But for the polar bear, ooh, the picture's coming out terribly there. For the polar bear, this is not a problem. Another thing that we discovered in this study is that all polar bears have pretty much no diversity, but it's been this way for a long time. Their populations have been very small for at least the last 100,000 years and probably longer, and they've done just fine. All polar bears have polar bear DNA. There is no brown bear DNA, even with the modern hybridizations going on in Canada, in polar bear populations. So as long as we maintain habitat for polar bears, they should be fine. So for polar bears, at least so far, the story is good. All we have to do is make sure that we don't let all of the ice disappear. And that's the end. And hopefully you guys have a... <laughs> this is my tent where I live in the summer. So this is in the Tymer Peninsula of Russia. Those are mosquitoes. <laughs> Arctic field work is awful. Awesome. <laughs> so anybody have any questions? That's a good question. What we did was we, um, we simulated the amount of polar bear genome that we estimated was, or the amount of hybridized genome that we estimated was in the other species, and then we randomly selected chunks of about that same size throughout the genome, and we did it a, you know, a million times or so, so that we were really randomizing across the genome. So it was trying to reflect the process that we thought happened so that we could better see what the outcome would be under a controlled scenario. isolated scenario and that this particular population of polar bears did turn into brown bears, but polar bears as a whole, as long as they stay in their habitat, are doing just fine. The polar bears that come down onto Canada, uh, onto the mainland of Canada and are hybridizing with brown bears are also turning into brown bears. But these are not then going back into the mass massive polar bear population and thereby polluting the rest of the polar bear genome with brown bear DNA. So it seems like once they come onto brown bear habitat, they start acting like brown bears and stay with other brown bears rather than return back into polar bear dump. It's interesting, we found a similar thing in Ireland. There was a population of brown bears that lived there during the last ice age, and we only got mitochondrial DNA from these things because they were 10 to 20,000 years old and their DNA was really badly preserved. But they also had polar bear mitochondria. So there must have been a similar thing happening at that point where polar bears were coming onto the island of Ireland at the time and hybridizing with that population. We found both brown bear and polar bear mitochondria there, though, so the situation probably wasn't identical. Probably it was males and females that were hybridizing instead of just males. This was really just a lucky chance that we got this weird thing going on in this island. One other thing just on that regard, and then I'll get to, to your question, is um, this is an example of how science and scientists go a little bit wrong. 
This hypothesis that ABC Island brown bears were the ancestor of all polar bears has existed in the literature and in the minds of people for such a long time that it was really hard to come up with this particular hypothesis. It was so different from anything that anybody imagined that we couldn't bring ourselves to step outside of what we assumed was the real story and think about something else. And it took generating a ton of data to see that the real story was actually much simpler than any of the really convoluted lots of hybridization in different directions scenarios that we'd come up with previously. And I'm included in that mess of people. I published a paper a couple years ago with one of the most crazy convoluted scenarios to try to explain these Irish bears. But this is how scientists, just like anybody else, get stuck on something. Once it becomes the thing that you think, it's hard to let go. And you really have to be willing to say, OK, I'm starting over, starting from scratch. Get new data. Yes? Uh, what was the effect of polar bear extinction in the sea? What are some of the effects of that? Should... Well, polar bears are a top predator up in the Arctic. And so probably you'd have an explosion of seal populations, which would have some influence. I mean, just like any keystone species, if you remove this thing, remove the top predator, it's going to be effects all the way down the trophic cascade. Um, I'm sure there's a, a lot of things that people have published about that. You guys are probably much more up on that kind of thing than, than I am. I'm just a geneticist. <laughs> what was the effect of removing a polar bear from the population of the, from the community? Drop in Klondike bar sales and Coca Cola. <laughs> <laughs> nice, yes, good, good one. Yes. Um, so, in one of the first trees you had up, it showed the split on the other side between other species like panda bears. Um, what kind of diversification effects do you have there? Or is it mostly hybridization, or what else helps clarify the final Um, I mean, the, just the deeper evolutionary lineage of bears. It's, you know, it's a funny group because there aren't that many fossils, and so it's really hard to know what the matching order and the evolutionary history of bears is. We know that pandas are pretty deeply diverged. They're, they're an old divergent lineage, but how long ago they actually diverged from other bears, we don't know. You know that tree that I had up was kind of a mess. You know, trees naturally are bifurcating. One lineage becomes two, becomes two, but in that particular tree, sometimes one became three or four. It's not because that's how it really happened. That's because we don't know what really happened. And we need more information and more fossils, really, to be able to understand it. In the back? Hi. Uh, I was wondering how many bears you, your team had to catch to, uh, to take in all the data. <laughs> There's probably a lot of like, birds on it. Yeah, we caught a lot of bears. Most of the bears I caught myself directly from um, Ian Sterling's freezer. <laughs> uh, we had to, there was one person on our team, we had a Russian collaborator who's a polar bear biologist who actually caught one of the bears. One of my students I had um, make a couple of, he, he wrote some stuff in R and did some analyses for us and made a couple of plots and I put it as an author on the paper. And he asked, he said, he saw Nikita's name in front of his in the authorship list. He said, what did this guy do? And we were like, I, I did all this work, how come this guy's ahead of me in the authorship list? And we were like, he caught a polar bear. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> In the green. What's the difference between having um, one, so between having like the polar bear um, become part of, like, is like become part of the brown bear population, the brown bear become part of the polar bear? What's different? How does that, I mean, because if you get half from your mom and half from your dad, then how does one go into the other. So in this particular case, what happened is you had a population of polar bears that was a small population of, say, you know, a number of polar bears, maybe 15 or 20 polar bears. And the first brown bears that came across would be one brown bear and 15 or 20 polar bears. But no more polar bears ever came into that population. And over time, there was just lots of brown bears coming across. And so you ended up having more and more and more brown bears, and then the polar bear part of those individuals, even though each time you had a single individual that was only half from mom and half from dad, it eventually, over the last 12 to 15,000 years, became very, very diluted to brown bear DNA, because all the new input was 100% brown bear, and there was no new input that was polar bears. Does that make sense? Yeah. Right here? Um, if hybridization has been happening for um, years and years, how do we define a species? That's how I started. 
What do you think? How do we define a species? It's a hard question, and I did say it's one that we haven't solved. <laughs> it's true. I mean, would you argue that we were a different species from Neanderthals? I would say there's some pretty extreme differences between us and Neanderthals. When, when, they, when we found that Neanderthals actually had stone tools, we were amazed. You know, here is a lineage of hominins, our ancestors or our relatives, that actually was able to use a technology to build something, to get something from the environment that they used for a different purpose other than what is intended. We built airplanes, you know? There's a difference between us and them. But we could interbreed and produce fertile hybrid offspring. <laughs> so what is a species? You don't eventually turn into one species or another. You might maintain characteristics of both. You might emerge as a separate entity all on your own that is a hybrid characteristic of these things. It all depends on the demographic scenario. This is a special case because it's an island. And people always say weird things happen on islands. And I think it's true. Genetically, weird things happen on islands. This island in particular is pretty weird. Yes? Um, originally you referred to it as the D test, and then you went back to Um But you kind of mentioned that Abba Baba wasn't exactly that accurate a name for it? It's called the Abba Baba test because it's looking for the sites that are ABBA and BABA. Um, I mean, the test was made up by, the whole thing was made up and named by some colleagues of mine to look for uh, hybridization between <coughs> Neanderthals and humans. So both names are kind of arbitrary and equally correct. It's just whatever you decide to use in the literature. Some people even call it Patterson's D statistic because one of the guys who first was involved with it, with it was a guy called Nick Patterson who's at, at the Broad Institute at Harvard. So, you know, you call it what you want, but they all mean the same thing. <laughs> having these Neanderthal genes. So they're not just coming in and doing nothing and disappearing. 
much of them probably are, but probably not, not all of them. Um, so what does it mean? This is a big question in the de-extinction debate, too. I mean, if we're going to recreate an extinct species, by sequencing genes from, say, a passenger pigeon and then sticking those genes into a living pigeon? Are we actually bringing back the passenger pigeon or are we bringing back the hybrid between the passenger pigeon and the living pigeon? I'm, I've been invited to give a talk in a, in a couple of weeks to a conference of CEOs, like really rich people in Silicon Valley, and I'm gonna talk about de-extinction. I was thinking at that point of saying, they're going to be hybrid. It's no longer going to be the stellar sea cow, so it's probably open for naming rights, you know, <laughs> wants to donate some money to the cause. <laughs> Spielberg, sea cow. We've, we've, seen, we've seen how well hybrids have sold. Sorry? We've seen how well hybrids have been sold. This would definitely be a strong Yes, exactly. <laughs> yes. Um, I was wondering, you mentioned that you have both lab work and field work about, like, what percent of your work is, like, of uh, I like field work, and I don't do enough of it. Um, the majority of my time is actually spent in front of a computer doing analysis, writing down math, and doing implementation of math stuff, even though I'm a biologist. Yeah. Um, I spend between a month and two months in the field every summer, and I get to do very little lab work these days. Most of the lab work's done by my students and postdocs. Um, and I spent all my time at work teaching classes and writing grants to try to raise people's salaries so we can keep going into the field and collecting stuff and doing more lab work. So it's not that romantic. The, lab, the field work is fun, though. <laughs> yes. Okay, once again, kind of gazing at the amount of data that you collected, how many people and how long did that take? This project? Yeah. Uh, well, this project was spearheaded by a graduate student of mine who's in the second year of his PhD. His name is James Cahill. Um, he analyzed all the data that was collected. Uh, generating the genomic data is actually not that hard to do these days. We just do one DNA extraction, make a little library, and then throw it at a sequencing machine that spits back billions and billions and billions of base pairs that James then has to try to sort through computationally. So most of the work is, again, writing computer programs and you know, writing down math and trying to solve problems uh, using modeling. Yes, one more? Here, three. So what causes, you talked earlier about how the genes continue to drift before they're like anchored down, so what actually causes that to happen? Uh, anybody here in that in the sophomore biology class today that's learning about genetic drift? <laughs> yeah, can, can one of those people answer the question about drift? What happens with drift? They eventually become fixed in a population, but just randomly, just by chance. But are there like factors that influence Not if they're neutrally evolving. If, if the mutations confer some selective advantage or disadvantage to the individual, then they will either, if they're advantageous, they'll fix faster, and if they're disadvantageous, they'll get be gotten rid of in the population faster. But if they're neutrally evolving markers, so they're not causing any individual to be more reproductively fit than any other individual, they will just drift around until they eventually, just by chance, become fixed or lost. Yes? <laughs> thank you. Well, let's thank Dr. Shapiro.